Hey, it's Joyce Conroy, host of The Block Party. We are back on Ernie's Corner, and I was telling Ernie, we want to talk all about John Mayall. And I'm looking at this design, and John Mayall, talk about Ernie, the alumni that have been in the Blues Breakers. I mean, you had Eric Clapton and Ainsley Dunbar, John McVie, just to name a few. Well, and a couple of guys from Canned Heat, too. You know, there were a couple of guys from Canned Heat that were that were part of, you know, uh, what he was doing. I mean, he goes all the way back to like in the 60s, you know, and, and I, I had I was a, a jazz fan and a blues fan. And I kind of, uh, you know, kind of discovered him that way in the late 60s for me. And then, you know, to see, yeah, that he had played with Eric Clapton, and Peter Green, you know, and Mick Taylor. You know, Mick went on to be the stone with the Stones. I mean, and, and it was really kind of, kind of neat that uh, you know. And I'm trying to remember the the guy's name from uh, it was oh, it was uh, Harvey Mand- Mandel and Larry Taylor from Can Heat, who then played with uh, with uh, with uh, John Mayall. You know, so he's he's got quite a history and a huge huge amount of product that he put out. It reminds me a lot of the Stones. And a lot like Alice Cooper, you know, where they have all these, this content that they keep producing, you know, and it, it was amazing. I mean, the number of, of, of albums, I think there's like 44 albums and uh, li- live albums and then concert albums and compilations and 44 singles. I mean, the guy is just really a plethora of, you know, music. You can tell that he really loves what he does, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and, so for, for you to ask to, to talk about this one is really kind of kind of intriguing to me, too, because I had to sort of put on my thinking cap and try and remember it was quite early for us. 1972, just as we had got started, uh, we had talked about this in other conversations we've had. Bill Levy, who was my mentor into the music business, that took me under his wing and taught me how to be a creative director. I didn't even know what a creative director did. You know, I mean, he taught me all that in the period of time from Jesus Christ Superstar till I went to Craig Braun, you know, and he was so patient and such a great person, you know, to have as a mentor. And years later we became, we reconnected and, you know, unfortunately he's passed away for four or five years now, but he was just amazing and helped us so much. I mean, when, when I had, when I went from where I did Jesus Christ Superstar, Norman Levitt, and I went to Craig Braun, Craig already had a reputation of people not liking him because he was this kind of guy that would be your best friend until you didn't have anything more that he needed. And then he'd move on to the next one, discard you or put you on a circle further away from the core, you know, and that's kind of how he measured relationships. He once drew it out for me. And, and so Bill really didn't have any love. In fact, I had lunch with Bill before I, left Norman Levitt and went to Craig Brun. And he said, you know, you really shouldn't do that. You just stay at Norman Levitt. You know, Norman's a great guy. Uh, You know, I'll continue supporting you with all the work that I can give you. Uh, And, you know, you you don't really need to go to Craig Brun, you know. And I did anyway because of the fact that it was a company that was amazing. Craig looked like a rock star. The, The people that he had working for him, I think there was about six or eight of them, And they were all young. There wasn't anybody over 35. And I had come from Norman Levitt had a lot of older people. You know, I was the kid there. I mean, there were people in their 50s and 60s, well-honed designers that I learned from. I learned a lot at Norman Levitt. And I and I still with Ron Lacey, who was there at, at Norman Levitt. We're still friends now on Facebook. And he became a designer and did all this great stuff. And he was there when I did Superstar. And then he would come and visit Jim Doyle and I over at Craig's. Because I Jim Doyle was somebody that I brought on at Norman Levitt to help me out with the work we were getting. Bill started giving us a lot of work. After Superstar, he really, I did the Aida, we talked about that earlier, the, the opera. Just beautiful package. And Bill was just a great guy. And, and so we stayed friends, even though I was at, Craig's, we still would have lunch and we'd still talk on the phone and stuff like that, but we didn't get any work. And I think that that was a disappointment for Craig because he was hoping, because I had such a great relationship with Bill Levy and he knew who Bill was. And let's face it, Decca Records was a great account to have. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So he was hoping that I would bring some of that work over there. But Bill just and he told me, uh, you know, 
I, I really love you, man, but I'm not going to give you any work while you're a great broad. You know, you know, and I, even though I advise against it, learn all you can learn and get ready to move on. And I'll support you, but I won't give you anything while you're there. But he's and an I, honest you know, mentor. That was wonderful how he was yeah, so honest. It really that. was. I mean, it, it was like when I left, uh, when after I did Dolls Alive and, and I got laid off by Armando Carloni, because that was the biggest project he would have all year. International Paper Company was his big town. That national sales meeting was huge. And, and he, you know, he brought me into his office where I thought I was going to get a raise and a promotion and all this stuff. And he, he fired me. Oh and he said, you're not going to understand now. It was kind of the same thing that Bill Levy did. You're not going to understand now. But I guarantee you, later on, you'll see what I did. Because you're the kind of guy that will become very comfortable here. And you'll compromise your talent for that paycheck. And honestly, I don't have the kind of work that you need to grow. And I, I just couldn't understand that. And, and Bill was, I mean, Bill, we're buddies. You, we've had dinner. You've come, you've come to my house. I've come to your house. You did in such place, cool apartment. And, you know, so we were really good friends. We really formed a great bonding. And, you know, I didn't understand why, you know, he wouldn't give work to me over there and then after being there for a while I, I got it I, I realized <laughs> it so that in 1972 when we started Pacific Iron Ear he he just opened up it was like it was like this windfall you know and we had talked about some of the albums this is another one John Mayall down the line is another one of those pieces that he you know as a creative director at a record company you get a lot of releases every month they're probably yes. anywhere between 15, depending on the size of the company. And Decca was a big company. You would get anywhere from a minimum of maybe 10 up to 30 or 40 releases every month in all these different categories. It wasn't Bill wasn't the creative director just for rock and roll. He was a creative director for all music that came out of Decca Records to be you know packaged and promoted. So he was in charge. It was a huge job. And you know, so when when we started Pacific Ioneer. Not only did he send us that huge Lucy graph, which was this opaque projector that would project images up and down and on walls and, and on illustration board where our illustrators would, you know, transfer their sketches to a piece of illustration board and then do it. I mean, rather than try and redraw it, this projected it on there. Didn't didn't burn an image. It just put it on there so you could draw, it, you know, and so it was it. He was just so forthcoming and when we talked and we would talk, he would call me and say, okay, I've got, you know, a couple of albums. So do you think you could do this? Do you think you could do that? When he called me on this John, John Mayall album, you know, he didn't do the photography. He was supplied the photography. Um, there wasn't a lot of support with pro, you know, with uh, material that they gave him to do this album. And really this album, we'll talk about it later, but it was a re-release of something he had done in 1964. Wow, so that be, far back. Yeah, yeah, but it was never released in the United States. It was all UK. He was much, much bigger in Europe mm -hmm. than in England than he was here. Okay, and jazz and blues, you know, even though it had a light flavoring of rock, uh, wasn't really a huge uh, category here. It was all about rock and roll, Woodstock and the bands, and you know, the bands from Northern California and all that. And, you know, and so, you know, he was more of a musician that was in a smaller niche that – wasn't really recognized until, you know, later on in his career. But, you know, uh, so, you know, when Bill, you know, offered this up um, that he um, said, you know, I don't have a lot to work with, but that's, you've come to, to realize that, you know, <laughs> because they would put, I mean, I remember going into Bill's office one time and he said, we, you know, we just signed in Europe, we just signed this new artist. And I think he's going to be huge. Listen to this album. It was, it was Elton John's uh, uh, Tumbleweed Connection. You know, he had the, the the rough discs and stuff, and we were listening to it in his office, and it was amazing. You know, I mean, so he he and then he, as a photographer, he had a chance to shoot stuff that he didn't go to Europe and stuff to do it like this was. So they supplied us with what you see behind me here, uh, actually on on well, you'll see it on the inside when we talk about this is a gatefold album, two record set. Okay, one of them was a re-release of something in 1964. The other one was a live concert that he had done and never really put it on a record and released it. So, you know, it was kind of a unique compilation of 
of his music. And so the pictures we had were really pretty weak uh, that were supplied to him. There was no time to, you know, go to Europe and shoot them again or even get a photographer there to shoot it. So we had to do the best we could. And I think one of the reasons why Bill did a lot of that for me was to teach me. It was a way it was like I was learning how to um, how to deal with different situations rather than having it be pristine every time you get it. You're going to throw a curve in there or put a, you know, put a, a, a switch on it that you're not ready for. So how are you going to perform as a creative director? You should learn that stuff. And so my whole relationship for years and years with him was that of a, a mentor teaching me. And I was really, really blessed. I had, we talked about Sister Mary Lucity in elementary school. Then there was, you know, other two or three other influencers that were mentors of mine before I went to New York and discovered Bill, you know, and it was, uh, it was pretty, a pretty amazing score for me. So we had these weak photographs and we needed, we needed something more dynamic to be a cover. So we found a picture I think Joe Garnett found it. Joe Garnett was the illustrator that did the doors full circle painting. And we did a lot of covers together and he did actually, he did the first Cheech and Chong album uh, with the worm and the flag and stuff. And, and I didn't really know who he was. And then when he, we started doing work with him and he joined us, he shut down his studio. He was a partner. I think I mentioned with Klaus Vorman was, a, was an artist as well, along with, you know, being a musician and working with the Beatles, he shared an, a, an office space, a studio with Joe, and he kind of left and went on to the music thing. And Joe was, you know, like, well, come on, Joe, join us. You know, we're, you know, and he was great. Joe was really great. He had, I think he had this picture because he was a, a big uh, John Mayall fan and was all excited about doing this album and then was very disappointed in the material that we had to work with. All, again, we had three weird, not so good pictures and a title. That's what we had. So Joe said, let, you know, let me do an illustration, of, you know, based on this picture. And so that's what you see behind me on the cover. Joe did that illustration. And it's I a love it. illustration. He probably did it in a couple of days. I mean, it was just all the one thing about all the illustrators that worked at Pacific Pioneer, even Drew Struzan, who was a painter, a fine art painter, uh, would rise to the challenge of deadline. Fine artists don't really have deadlines. Commercial artists have deadlines. And that's what everything is based on. That's what gets you to be used again and again coming through. You know, not, and I've had people not come through and it's, it's devastating, you know, and it, and it really hurts my relationship with them and it hurts our reputation. And, and for me, Pacific Ioneer was the most, next to Bonnie, Pacific Ioneer was the most important thing in my life and my relationship with my partner. Who, we didn't like each other in the beginning, but grew to be like brothers. Um, so Joe did this beautiful illustration and, you know, thinking, you know, what can I add? It just wasn't enough. It still wasn't enough to be a cover. So I was thinking about it and I started sketching. I was doodling John Mayo, you know, down the line. And it kind of, I got kind of crazy with the lettering. And again, I'll send you these images so you can blow them up, but it's, it's crazy. That lettering is really crazy. And so I started working on that and, and I did this sketch and then I put a piece of, of vellum over it and started inking it. Again, all this is done with rapidograph pens and circle templates and, you know, curve, you know, curve, plastic curves and stuff that you could get in there. And then, you know, part of it was I was able to do one half of it. And then for the other side, you know, left and right of his illustration, I was able to flip, I send it to the stat house and they would flip it. And so I could put the two things together. I did Jesus Christ Superstar the same way. It, I did one half of it. And instead of trying to draw the other half and make it match, you could just send it to the stat house and they could flip it. And then you could put the two things together. You That's know, and, ingenious. I never, yeah, it never is. I mean, it saves, it saves a lot of time. Yeah. And as you will see, you know, from the front and back of this cover, that lettering and that line art that I did, got really kind of out of control. But what I what I liked about it was that it it put everything together. It drew it all, it it it, it sort of gave it all a, a foundation to live in. That picture of John Mayall has a framework that it can live inside of. And it's not, you see John first, it's not stealing from him, 
But right immediately afterwards, you know, you see John Mayo down the line. So, you know, and I, I had only heard through Bill Levy that they really loved it in Europe. John himself really loved the cover, you know, and, and so it really became a very, um, it, it became a very good thing for us, certainly because of the prestige of doing something for John Mayo, but also coming through for Bill Levy, who, like the Brady Bunch, you know, was at a, at a, a stopping point. He just didn't know what to do. You know, and especially in that case, we didn't really have any pictures, really. We had to look at, you know, taking stills from from the television, their show to try and, you know, have Joe Patagno do the caricatures of them uh, because there was really no Internet where you could go and get it. You know, so this, you know, putting the lettering together with Joe's illustration, I think, really, really worked well. And then on the back cover, you know, we had to put all the credits and stuff. We didn't really have any additional photography. So it had to then, I had to then manipulate the border to work with letting the lettering live inside it as well as having John on the front cover live in that. So it was a, it was a, a real, you know, sometimes when you're doing a lot of stuff, but let's keep it on, on album covers, you have stuff that you get. You get a title, you get a logo from the group, or you get some lettering, or you get a sketch from the creative director if that's where you're going with it, or you do a sketch to show the musician. And, and, in, and, and we had photography. Sometimes we could control the photo session, you know, on the Sesame street thing that we're going to be talking about next week, I was able to go there and be there and met big bird and met, you know, it was amazing. It was amazing, you know, and I didn't grow up with it. I mean, I, I came into Sesame street much older than the audience that he had. John Mayall for me was, it was just great because like I said, I really loved uh, him and the stuff that he had done. And from 1963 to 2019, he did 36 studio albums, 34 live albums, 36, um, 24 compilation albums and 44 singles from, from 1963 to two. And that's when I graduated high school, 1963 and to 2019. He produced all that work. I mean, it's just, he's a lot like Drew Struzan. Drew is like that. He produces so much work. And even though he's kind of retired, not doing anything commercially anymore, um, he still paints for himself. I was in his place a, about a year ago and he was doing all these amazing paintings of Laurel and Hardy, you know, from, uh, and from the old, and just beautiful stuff. And he'd paint it and put it away. He had a big kind of warehouse that he would put all this stuff. And because he had a son, he had grandchildren, and that's his legacy. I mean, he used to tell Bonnie that, you know, a lot, because Bonnie used to work with us, and Drew was there, and I'd be giving away pieces, sketches, and pieces to the musicians. And he would go to Bonnie and say, you know, tell him to not do that, man, because that's your guy's retirement. He knew even then that he was going to be exceptional, you know, and Joe Garnett, the same way. Joe was just an incredible artist that could do just about anything. He was a designer. He was an illustrator. You know, he, he was, and he could work very fast. Drew worked really fast. Drew never made a mistake on anything he ever did. He never made a mistake, never had to get. The only thing that he had to do twice was the Tony Orlando and Dawn album. I remember we, uh, that story because yeah. Tony, you know, it was, you know, he, he felt that, you know, uh, Dawn should be, um, not not secondary in a nasty way, but secondary on the design. Tony yeah, wanted to stand out more. And I remember that. And that was a challenge for you guys. But you handled it. Yeah, well, you know, there was no Photoshop or anything then. No. And we had, he had to do a second illustration. And they're completely different. And, you know, in a way, it's great because I own the art. I have both pieces of anything that he ever had to do twice. When he went into the, and I've had this conversation, when he went into the movie poster business, it wasn't like that. He was dictated to, you know, constantly on what needed to be and where he had to do, leave areas for this and that. I mean, a movie poster was a lot different in, in you know, size of credits of people's mm -hmm. names and stuff. There's a lot of stuff. And I've done a few posters, uh, but, you know, that's a, it's a funny business. It, it's something like, be careful what you wish for. I wanted so badly to, after I left Pacific Eye and Ear, 
I wanted to, because all the guys that worked with went on to the movie business. I wouldn't go because I owned the company. Once the company was gone, I wanted to get into the movie poster business because like album covers, you could do it. And then a few, a month later or three weeks later, you go to a record store and there it is. You know, there's your piece already out there to the public. Same with movie posters. You know, they, you, they have the art. It's there in a big key art, you know, display and mm -hmm. all the stuff that's immediate, you know. Uh, and so, but then when I got into it, I went to work for a company that just did movie posters and it was terrible. It was like a nightmare. You know, it was like, Oh my God, it was like jumping into a meat grinder, you know, every day and just being creatively yeah. ground up, you know? That's and so you know, for me, the, the record business was not like that at all. And the fact that the, the support that I had from the team at Civic Ioneer, the creative team was immense. I mean, we could take stuff and turn, we could turn an album in a couple of days, including an illustration, mechanicals, concept lettering everything we were doing sit between six and eight album covers a month along with the, the corporate work and there's in the collection that we have there's probably two or three times more corporate pieces than there were album covers so we were doing every month we would do say at a minimum we would do six albums like this one and then we would do two or three corporate projects and it was it was a tough thing to do but we all learned Drew learned, Bill learned, Joe, we all, Ingrid learned. We learned that, you know, we needed to be productive and we needed to, and, and the more productive you became, it's like you and I talked about earlier today, about how the more you do it, the more you push yourself, the more you learn and the better you get at it. You, you create a skill. It's like me with lettering. I hated lettering. I, I hated it. My mother used to get me sign painting jobs. I hated it, <laughs> you know, and, and then all of a sudden it became so easy. I, it was like something that you regret and you, and you try to stay away from, but all of a sudden you get into it and it's like, hey, this feels pretty good. You're a natural because I'm looking at this down the line design and I see a G clef. I, I don't know if that was what you were intending. Yes, the but music part of it, the, the flow, the, the rhythm flow. and flow of his music, the jazz and the blues with a little, little touch of rock. It, it, it was important. Joe Garnett, in his illustration, depicted John Mayle. It's a great drawing of him. It's, he's got the guitar. He looks like he's performing live. And it was kind of like a live album, believe it or not. A lot of the stuff was already re-recorded at live concerts and stuff and taken. Um, and, and so I needed to do something that worked with it. It wouldn't have been right to just put his name across the top in some type. No, that's not John. That's not no, John. It's you not John. It. It's not his music. And it's not right for what Joe had done. You know, that was the other thing. Drew, to this day, will say the thing that he liked a lot about working at Pacific Ioneer was we always took in consideration where that illustration was going to be and where the lettering could complement it. I was always complimenting. I used to say that Drew only... Uh, only worked on things with three other three other artists that they did things together, and that was true at Pacific Ioneer. There was a, a, a Black Oak, Arkansas, Early Times album. There was a Alice Cooper's Greatest Hits, and then he did the original Star Trek movie poster. He did the faces. Char Charlie White the Third did the, the airbrush illustration stuff. So there were only I used to say he only did you know sort of work with another illustrator on three things, but then it dawned on me that. I worked on every project that we ever worked on together. I was a co-author. If I, you know, he and I together created these pieces. So, you know, some people would say, well, why are you putting your name in the same category with Drew Susan on this Welcome to My Nightmare piece? Well, because I co-authored it with him. I came up with the concept and the lettering and he did the illustration. We did it together. If both of us wrote a song, and the song had royalties, we would get the royalties and share them. That's how it works. And the same thing applies to illustrations. So I, yeah. every one of those illustrators that I work with, I actually contributed to what they had done as a finished piece. That so, is wonderful. I, well, your integrity yeah. is, and that's what comes out, you know, in the work that I have seen with you in Pacific Eye and Ear. I am looking at John's face, and I know that he's very uh, dedicated when it comes to the blues and performing. What I see is this intensity 
really captured in his face, kind yeah, of like he, even looking toward the future in his eyes. Yes, yes, it's yes. And, and, and that's why it was so important that I couldn't just do lettering that said John Mayo down the line across the top. It had to be the same way. Exactly. You nailed it. The same way you talked about the intensity of John, of John and Joe's illustration of him. I needed to complement that. That's the word I was looking for. Complement with, and thank you, uh, to complement the other piece of it. Joe had the intensity. I needed to reflect the blues and the jazz and the flow, the rhythm, the oh, rhythm of wow. his music. And as you see it across, you know, uh, the front and back cover. And now I'm going to I'm going to quickly go to um, the inside cover uh, because it was a go. It was a gatefold double record set. And this is the inside right here. Uh, let's see. Okay. So what you see behind me there is the three p the three pictures that we got. <laughs> OK. And as you can see, none of them have. What you nailed so well, Joyce, the intensity, the looking on to things to come, to be the confidence that that's reflected in that front cover illustration is not depicted in any of these three drawings or these three pictures. And they were weak. I mean, we beefed them up to look. And like I said, Joe, uh, Bill Levy didn't do these photographs. Some of the albums that we did together, he did the photography of. You know, we had better stuff, but this was really nothing good to work with but so how do you put those three pictures in there and make it relate to the front and back cover you know uh and so again carrying through doing the lettering that i did for him and carrying through that border idea of how it would embrace the credits on the inside the lyrics i think it's just credit actually no it's lyrics i think but uh, and, and that which is in there, it's on the back, too. I mean, how do you bring all that together and make it flow? You know, and, and so for me, that was like, you know, pro, you know, de demand one. It needed to work with the outside mm -hmm. and, and, and the inside. So it wasn't like you're looking at the outside. No, that's when you open it up. It's a whole different thing. It needed to somehow flow through the whole thing, like his music. You know, and, and we, we, you know, we talked about this, this, uh, this particular double record set. Record one was a U.S. debut of, uh, of an album that he had done in 1964. So, and it was never released in the United States. So they just sort of took that and made it the whole album. And then the second album was a live concert at, I got to get this, Clooks. K L O O K S, Clooks and Leaks concert. It was a live concert that he did. And as the, uh, you know, as the Blues Breakers, and was uh, a compilation of when he did that concert. Eric Clapton was there, Peter Green was there, Mick Taylor was there. They, and so this second record is really unique because, again, it had never been released and never even put together. It was just a live concert that they had recorded and they never really, really released it anywhere, but I, I guess in England, but it was it, when it debuted here, it really was something very special. And, and it, it's a great album. It's a great double record set. And it was a big challenge for us, but I think that we achieved it really, really well. I agree. I yeah. fully agree. And, you know, the beauty of it is when it came to the blues, really have to thank the British because we've had some great blues artists here, you know, like B.B. King, for instance. And sure. poor B.B. used to get booed by, by yeah. people. But it was yeah. uh, John Mayall, Eric Clapton, Peter Green. They, uh, Robert Plant, I will put Robert in there. And how about the Rolling Stones? Yes, yes. Very Eric influenced by, by American blues. Chuck yeah. Perry, you know, you know, uh, Little Richard, you know, I mean, they and, and the Beatles, too. I mean, a lot of the, those groups early music was re the remakes of American blues arts. Very you much know? so. Like yeah, Lucille, down the line, down, down the, the line. line. Yeah. And you're and you're you know, the, 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 the design that you did is perfect. It almost like it's a river leading to the future. Yes. So yes. And, 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 you know, it's so, 
And so you're so wonderful in, in picking that up. I mean, you know, I, it's something that I usually have to explain and validate, but you get it right away. I mean, that's such a great thing about, you know, you and I have talked about it many times. What we both bring to each one of these things is great. You know, you just amplify with, you know, with stuff that I wasn't even aware of, but you're a perfect consumer. You're the perfect person that I was trying to relate to and, and talk to with these packages that we did, you know, and I tried to do that no matter and you've seen, you've seen some packages where there was nothing to start with and you made something that fit that age group, fit that niche that, you know, you were trying to hit. And I think, John, this album down the line is a perfect example of that, you know. And again, Bill Levy was very pleased. I heard through he, him uh, and he was talking to the people in London and England, which was a label that was distributed by and owned by uh, DECA. Uh, you know, and, and again, he was in such a high position there that he got a chance to meet all these artists, and, you know, and got a chance to photograph them as well. He had an incredible library of photography. And a few years before, uh, probably five or six years before he passed away, we reconnected and I helped him figure out how to put those photographs to, you know, to use today and how to market them and how to, you know, and, and, and he started doing that. And then he passed away, you know, I mean, I, I was still in touch up to a couple of years ago with his wife. Um, just wonderful, wonderful guy. Just somebody that, you know, will always have a place in my heart. Always. You know, just like you. Oh, gosh. I Truth. don't know what to Truth. say. Thank Truth. you so much. <laughs> you, know, you, you brought a whole nother level to what I do, what we can do together. It's awesome. And now let me see if I know what you're going to ask. Oh, let me see. I got to ask that magic question, my friend. I'm putting my <laughs> hand up to get a, mill, a mind melt. A mind All righty. I, I feel something coming out of my head. <laughs> I hope it's not my brains. That, that's not No, good. no. It, it's all good. You know, I, it's, it's again, this is a hard one because there's so many great things and, and stuff that people have never heard. Even to this day, if you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're a John Mayall fan, you might have heard of it you might have seen it but more not you know maybe not because there was so much content so many things that he had done and created with different people and stuff so for me i break it down two ways the songs in record one are great and for me highway uh let's see hide hideaway hideaway would be oh, my first choice on record one. and uh, uh was saturday uh, stormy monday blues Stormy Monday Blues is something that everybody will relate to because we all have that Monday morning. And that song is amazing. So if I had to choose between those two, it would be a hard choice. But, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Stormy Monday Blues would be my choice for record one. For record two, it would be Crocodile Walk and Night Train slash Lucille. And it goes right back to what we were talking about with blues american blues lucille you know it's, it's just a, a remake of that and uh night tra uh, of uh night train right so if i had to choose between those two it would probably be crocodile walk